speaks to us, isn't it? If you have a Bible, please open to Matthew chapter 9. Thanks so much, Ben. You've blessed us. We're going to give you an opportunity again. I've got a very interesting topic to share with you this morning. Um, depending on where your heart is, I think some of you will be really blessed. <laughs> and I trust, depending if your heart is in a place where you need this word, you'll even be more blessed. Matthew chapter 9, I want to talk to you about fasting. I don't know how many of you have heard a preach on fasting in a recent bit. Okay, there's a couple. Wonderful. Wonderful. And so my heart really is just to help us apply the gospel. If I had to ask any one of you this morning, what's the gospel? Most of you, I trust, will say it's about what Jesus did for us on the cross. He died for us. He was dead for three days, he was raised to life, and his resurrection power is for all of us to live with. For most of my life, I got taught that the gospel is about Jesus coming to help me with my life. Would you say that's true? Is that the gospel that you've heard? That Jesus came to help you with your life. Now there's some level of truth of that, there's some measure of truth in it, but the real gospel is not the fact that Jesus comes to help you with your life. The gospel is that Jesus comes to give you his life. It's a subtle difference, friends. If we think that the gospel is about Jesus helping me with my life, we have the danger or we run the risk to just patch Jesus onto our old life, hoping it'll get better. I know some people that's, that's keen to break the nicotine addiction. The latest way of doing it is you put a sticker on your shoulder. And you trust that that, that that sticker is going to make the difference and break your nicotine addiction. Anyone that's tried that? Or shall we not ask you to raise hands to touch you on that? But often when it comes to the gospel, we think the gospel is just like that. That we need to patch Jesus onto our lives and then hopefully he'll make the old life a bit better. The gospel, as Paul helps us understand, is the fact that Jesus says, I'm done with your old life. I don't come to patch up your old life. I'm not coming to help you with your old life. I'm coming to give you my life. And so it's important that you understand, if you want to enjoy the life of Jesus, Jesus says, you have to learn how to die to the old life. If you want to enjoy Him, you have to die to the old life so that you can embrace His life. Paul says it this way in Galatians 2.20. He says, I no longer live. I've been crucified with Christ. I died with Christ. But now Christ lives in me. How does Jesus live inside of us? By the Holy Spirit. We become born again. Now, the previous two weeks, I spoke about the, the value of speaking in tongues. And I could see I was making some of you mad. There's a couple that walked out as I, as I announced the, the title of speaking in tongues. Like, oh my goodness. We spoke about the value of speaking in tongues when, you, when, you, when you're getting tempted. How speaking in tongues helps you with temptation How, not to be tempted. Let me just correct that. Otherwise you think speaking in tongues is going to help you to get tempted. No. Speaking in tongues helps you when you get tempted. Speaking in tongues helps you with timidity when you face fear. This morning I want to talk about the value of fasting. See, speaking in tongues is one of the tools that Jesus helps us with. Fasting is another tool that Jesus helps us with. And they work together in perfect harmony. The Bible says, because you're born again, Romans chapter 8, verse 10, is that your spirit is alive to God because of righteousness. When you speak in tongues, you are sensitizing your spirit to the Holy Spirit. It's wonderful moments when it happens, isn't it? 
But Romans 8 verse 10 also says that there's the position of death that your body has. And so speaking in tongues helps you with this position of life, of the reality of God inside of you. And when you speak in tongues, your spirit gets sensitized to the Holy Spirit. Fasting, it enforces the position of death that you have towards sin and towards the fear of death. So these two powerful tools work together. In Matthew chapter 5 and 6, Jesus tells us about the kingdom. He says the kingdom is forcefully advancing. You need a certain attitude, the be attitudes, the attitude of being. If you accept those attitudes, the kingdom will start to manifest through your life. And then here's an amazing thing. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, guys, by the way, there's attitudes in the kingdom that you need to adopt. And there's certain actions you can take if you want the kingdom to manifest through your life. Who'd like to have more of the kingdom manifest through your life? Amen. There's three tools. The first tool, guess it, is prayer. Speaking in tongues is the purest form of prayer. The second tool, you want to guess? Help me. Fasting. Oh my goodness. Now, I'm not talking about fasting to get a six pack. You'll discover in a moment. Because there's a great fad out there that you can get your six pack for Jeffrey's Bay ready if you do the fasting intermittent thing. But that kind of fasting. The last one it says when you give. Those three tools are three things that you and I can do if we want to participate in the kingdom of God. You want to learn to unlock the fullness of the life of God that is placed inside of you. Interesting that the enemy resists the speaking in tongues in the church. Many churches like, uh, many believers like, oh. Uh, interesting that we hear so little about fasting that's crucifying the flesh. And interesting how generosity has been hijacked in the past. And so we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus, the whole book of Matthew is about the kingdom of God. How does the kingdom of God manifest in our life? How the kingdom of God started manifesting when Jesus the king came into Jerusalem. So in Matthew chapter 9 verse 14 it says, Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn when he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No. They pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Holy Spirit, help me this morning to communicate truth in a way that will transform us. Thank you that you've anointed me to serve your people. And I ask you for fresh anointing, fresh enabling this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. What Jesus is busy dealing with in Matthew chapter 9 is he's dealing with the value of fasting. Now here's what I need to, need to say on the outset. Fasting affects the quality of of your worship. Fasting affects the quality of the wine, the activity of the Holy Spirit, the quality of what you're enjoying. And then fasting affects the quantity of the Holy Spirit. How much of the Holy Spirit can you enjoy? So Jesus says the key to a life of of quality worship towards Jesus, fasting is the key. Jesus says if you want to enjoy the quality of the activity of the Holy Spirit, fasting is the key. And then he says something that is profound. He says if you want to enjoy more of the quantity of the Holy Spirit, fasting is the key. You keen to hear more? Was that enough for this morning? So let's start with the quality of your worship. 
fasting affects the quality of your worship. John's disciples are following John for one simple reason. They are passionate about God. And they're finding in John a radical man. I'm not sure whether he wore underpants, but I know this. He wore a camel hair suit, the latest Gucci edition. He was radical for God. And so John created a following. Some disciples were following John saying, my goodness, it seems like the Lord is busy doing something with you. We want to follow. We want to have that. And so they're busy fasting. Why? Because the law required you to fast. And if you wanted to become a teacher, a rabbi, you're going to, you're going to have to, you were, you were forced to have to go through seasons of fasting because it was a legal requirement. Now Jesus walks on the scene and his disciples are following him. And here's the big thing. His disciples are not fasting. His disciples are feasting. And John's disciples are, oh my goodness, come on now. How, how do you do that? Do you not know that there's a requirement that you should be fasting? Don't you know if you want to really worship God, you're going to have to fast? Jesus says, no, guys, you're missing the point. Fasting is not about a legal requirement. Fasting is about a relational need. He says, let me help you understand while I'm with the disciples, while I'm walking amongst them, they've got access to me. We can laugh together. We can eat together. We can have fun together. Why? Because there's fellowship. There's proximity. But there will come a day when I'm going to leave. And when I leave, they're going to long for that friendship, that relationship. On that day, they will fast. Fasting shapes your fellowship with Jesus. Fasting affects your desire for Jesus. How much do you desire Him? How much do you desire to know His voice, to hear His voice, to be with Him, to just sit in His presence? Or do you desire the things of the world more? Now let me just say, fasting is not muting your WhatsApp group. Fasting is not saying, um, I'm going to just block my Netflix subscription for this month. That's called wisdom. That's not called fasting. <laughs> You're right. Fasting is when you go without food for a period of time and you only drink water. That's fasting, according to the Bible. Why? Because this stomach of yours has got very funny intentions with you. The stomach of yours, this body of yours wants to have what it asks for, and when it asks for, it wants it now. Make sense? And so fasting really deals with your desire. Do you desire Jesus, or do you desire food, or do you desire alcohol, or do you desire Netflix, or do you desire relationships, or do you desire the money? Whatever you desire, fasting purifies your desire, so that your desire will be for Jesus alone. This desire thing is massive. This desire thing, a church gets rebuked for. This church was started out of a radical encounter and the power of God that transformed and caused a base church in Ephesus to preach the gospel to a whole province in two and a half years. A little while later, this church that was so radical at its birth got rebuked for their lack of desire. They knew how to recognize the true apostles, the true prophets. They were working hard, but something happened to their desire. Somehow, Jesus was not so desirable anymore. Fasting messes with that desire. It cuts away all the illegitimate desires that's, that's vying for your heart, that wants to lay a hold of your heart. And so Jesus says, listen, when you fast, fasting is for fellowship with me. Fasting is not for getting a six-pack. Fasting is not for putting your food addiction aside. Fasting is because you desire to fellowship with me. So if you're fasting and you're not spending time with Jesus, then you're just dieting. 
And it's a very ineffective diet. Let me just warn you. <laughs> you okay? When last did you say, I'm just going to go without. I'm going to go without the things that the world wants to put on me because I just want to fellowship with Jesus. I want to hear His voice. I want to be in His presence. I just want to enjoy Him. I want Him to love on me. When last? I'm not trying to get you guilty. I'm trying to stir your affection for Him. Many believers say, man, if someone can just help me hear the voice of the Lord. My Bible says to me, if you're born again, the sheep knows the voice of the shepherd. If you're not born again, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to him in a moment. But if you're born again, you are programmed, pre-programmed to hear his voice. Maybe it's time for you to say, I'm going to just fast a little bit so that my desire for him and the ability to hear his voice can be clarified. It's okay, the previous meeting had the same response. Why? Because we, had, we heard the gospel preached that Jesus did everything for me. And I can just sit back and just say, well, I'm just an innocent bystander. Let's see how the world goes. I'm going to make it to heaven one day, so I'm okay. That's the gospel we've heard. And Jesus has done it all for us to have friendship with God. But there's certain things you can do to unlock this desire to walk with God, to enjoy Him, to fellowship with Him. You hearing me? How do you know if maybe you do for a fast? Thank you so much for asking the question. How do you know that you're a good candidate this morning to maybe put food aside? How do you know that there's a little bit of worldliness that has crept into this heart of yours? How do you know? I'm so grateful for the story in the Bible. It says John's disciples were comparing themselves with Jesus' disciples. How do you know that worldliness has crept into your system? You're living a life of comparison, not a life of compassion. If that's you this morning, let me just say again, red light, listen to this one. If you're living a life of constantly comparing yourself to others and you're never satisfied, maybe it's time that you get your desires sorted out. A little bit of fasting goes a long way to deal with your comparison issues so that you can get compassionate. quality of your worship gets affected when you fast. Now, some of you are like, man, give us good news. My friends, I promise you this is good news. This is good news. I remember when the Lord said, I want you to do a certain routine of fasting. I remember what it felt like for me. It's like, oh my goodness, but I'm going to starve. I mean, all the rugby muscle I built up, I'm going to lose all of that. All the reasoning. What about food? Can I go without food for so long? Is it not going to be detrimental? But my desire <laughs> was compromised. Food compromised my desire. I had a little food addiction going on the side. And it's one of those addictions that the world doesn't really frown upon too much because it's not an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction. You know, we're quite critical that way. If I compare myself to Joe that's sitting in the bar every Friday night drinking himself to death. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. It's interesting how when I started this fasting journey, all of a sudden I was so happy to start preparing food for my family when they eat. Just to be close to food. Just to smell food. So happy to just serve you. No, it's such a privilege to serve you. What, the, what is the Lord dealing with? He's dealing with my addiction to food. It's compromising my desire. <laughs> the kids would joke. And I, now when I start serving them, I say, Dad, are you fasting again? <laughs> you see, we have these little things, friends. Jesus came to give his life to you, but that life is compromised because your desire is for the world and not for Jesus. 
And I mean, it's so easy to blame the church. It's so easy to blame the preacher. It's so easy to blame your wife. It's so easy to blame, to blame. But you put food aside a little bit. You eat water and you eat the word. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. Then Jesus uses a fascinating example when he talks about the, the wine. Now, who enjoys a good wine? The rest of you are not honest, eh? Okay, let me ask, who enjoys cheap wine? Partij van jou van branne wine. Jesus says, listen, let me talk sense into your head because you love the earthly and the natural things. Let me help you with spiritual understanding. If you think, if you think Branavain is something, try tasting the Holy Spirit. If you think Clippies and Coke is a solution, my friend, I want to invite you to start to drink of the Spirit. You have no idea. And here's the benefit, there's no bubblers. The more you have the Spirit, the more you drink, the more you want. Isn't it so with clippies and coke? I mean, I'm not a real, I had some heydays, but I'm not a real connoisseur. Jesus says, listen, the quality of the wine that you can have, the quality of the activity of the Spirit of God in your life is determined whether you understand this value of fasting. None of us want to drink cheap wine, isn't it? We all want the matured stuff, the Cabernet Sauvignon of 2010. And then we look at it and we, 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 you know, if you're really sophisticated, you look at it in the light to see the color and then you smell it as if it's going to help you which vineyard it came from. And then you, you taste it, you know. If you go to these fancy restaurants, they come, they pour a little bit into your glass. As the, as the gentleman of the, of, the, of the house, I had to learn this because I come from Swaziland. There's only Branova. The first time I, I took my wife to a fancy restaurant, they, I thought, so I thought, okay, well, let me see. So I'm, you say you can, you can taste it, sir. So I'm tasting it. It's like, okay, that sounds a little bit bitter, but I suppose it's good. And then he walks to my wife and he pours her glass first. I'm like, what was that about? But we all like quality wine, isn't it? Jesus says, if you understand the value of fasting, fasting enables you to drink the quality wine, the activity of the Holy Spirit, to enjoy the activity of the Holy Spirit. What is that activity? Well, thank you for asking. What happens to new wine? New wine has to go through a fermentation process in which the sugars gets broken down into very simple particles that affects the color, the flavor, and the taste. So when you get born again, when the life of Christ gets planted into your life and, and He starts to live in you, the Spirit of God starts to live in you, He says, okay, now we're starting with the breaking down process. Let's break these fleshly mindsets, these worldly sweetnesses. Let's break it down because those things are not going to help you and it's going to hinder your enjoyment of the activity of the Holy Spirit. But when you fast, when you put food aside, the fermentation process starts. All the stuff that stinks on your life, your family gets exposed to. Your poor wife gets exposed to. Your kids get exposed to why? Because there's these impurities, there's these things in your life that has to be broken down. And often, often, we look at the activity of the Holy Spirit and we think, yeah, I think maybe it's for them, but it's not for me. Fasting helps you to enjoy the activity of the Holy Spirit. quality of the wine, the quality of the Spirit is related to how much you depend on Him. Can I say that slowly again? Your enjoyment of the 
Holy Spirit. The, the quality of your enjoyment of the Holy Spirit is fully equivalent to your dependence on the Holy Spirit. How much do you depend on Him? Or how much do you depend on your reasoning, your understanding, your talents, and your abilities? Please track with me. If you want to enjoy the activity of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to learn to depend on Him. Fasting helps you with your dependence on the Holy Spirit. Because when you fast, your flesh gets dealt with. You become weak. You don't have energy. You don't have courage. You just feel like a mess. And so it forces you to say, oh, Holy Spirit, please, please, please help me. What do you think starts to happen? He's been waiting all along. He's been waiting for you to say, I was wondering when you're going to ask me to help. Fasting, expedite that process. Now I get some of you, it's like, no, just tell us about what Jesus has done. I'm trying. But I'm also trying to empower you that you know what you can do so that you can be effective in the days in which we live. That God can use your life powerfully in the kingdom of God. It's an overwhelming amen. You guys are right? Wonderful. Then, Jesus says that fasting not only deals with the quality of the wine, fasting deals with the quantity of the wine. There's a difference. Quality and quantity. When I was a student, it wasn't about the quality so much, it was about the quantity. It seems like I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> Jesus says, listen, it's possible for you not to just enjoy the quality of the Holy Spirit, but the quantity, how much you have of Him. How much of his activity you are partnering with, how much of God you are enjoying, it's directly related to the wine skin that's in your life. Your ability to hold and embrace the life of God, the diversities of God. What's the wine skin referring to? It speaks about the attitudes and the thought patterns of your soul, the way you think, your set mind, your mindset the way your mind has been set, and it deals with the attitudes of your heart. Now your mind might be set in a certain way. You know that you love Jesus, but your mind is set in a certain way that you're limiting Jesus. Fasting deals with that mindset. You might tell me, man, I love Jesus, but your attitude somewhere along the line has been compromised that you won't do Anything Jesus asks you when he asks you. Say, no, I love Jesus, but I don't know if I will do everything. Fasting deals with that attitude. So how much do you want of the Holy Spirit? How much do you want to enjoy of him? God says he will give his spirit without limit. The problem is many believers are leaking because their mindsets are wrong. The attitudes are wrong. Fasting deals with your mindset and with your attitude. Amazing how Jesus uses these two examples. He says the first one, it's like a, 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 a cloth that has been washed. Have you ever tried to wash wool or cotton in a tumble dryer? Wash it and then put it in a tumble dryer. Anyone? Anyone that's lost your favorite t-shirt in a tumble dryer? Me and Arno, in two, three years. It's amazing when you, it's a, quite a feeling when you put your favorite t-shirt in a washing machine, and when it comes out, it's half its size. What has happened to it? The washing of that thing has shrunk it. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about mindsets that are small in the kingdom of God, that cannot embrace the bigness of what God wants to do. 
He's talking about heart attitudes that is keeping you small in the things of God because you are more happy to be small. And Jesus says, listen, I'm not just going to patch my life on you. I need to give you a whole new garment. Fasting deals with your small-mindedness. It deals with the limitations that you place on God. It deals with the expectations that you've lowered so much that you think God cannot use your life. Read for the wineskin. He says, watch out for a wineskin that has been used, that has become so rigid that when the life of God, the activity of God wants to move, that wineskin breaks. What's he talking about? He's talking about mindsets and hearts that has become so rigid in how you think you must engage God. It's your way or the highway. You become so rigid, you've got your way, you're set in your ways, you're, you're so stuck that the moment the Spirit of God wants to move, it falls on the floor. There's no traction, there's no activity. <laughs> you okay? Can we quickly stand? Just where you're at, just quickly stand. Just want to break your rigid mindset. And then you can grab a seat again. What does fasting do? Fasting deals with these set patterns that you've got, these set attitudes you've got, that God cannot move through your life outside of your little box. Come now. Speaking in tongues? No, not for me. Raising the dead? Definitely not for me. Speaking to others, cleansing lepers, man, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think Yannis is that crazy one. Let him try. Come now, church. Fasting deals with the wine skins that are so rigid in our lives that we cannot hold the dynamic activity of the Holy Spirit. If I'm honest, that's why you're uncomfortable at the base. Because the Spirit is constantly doing this and doing that. It's like near that. I can't believe I can a sector. We can't predict what the Spirit of God is doing. Fasting deals with that rigid mindset. There's new things the Lord wants to bring on old truth, new revelation, fresh revelation. You're like, no, 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 doesn't fit my wheelbox. Fasting helps you with your rigid thinking so that you can walk in revelation. What is God saying? What is God speaking? Amen? It's interesting for me to, to see the resistance <laughs> that's on this truth. It's interesting. I, would, I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in your kitchen this afternoon as you're discussing this preach. <laughs> With your leg of lamb, sweet potatoes, malfa pudding and cook sisters and coffee afterwards. <laughs> I'll come for that one as well. I wonder, friends, what has happened to our desire for Jesus? What has happened that we have got an opportunity to, to cause impact, to have impact for Him in the West Rand, in South Africa, and the nations of the world through which He's going to use us? Not just me. Maybe it's time that you have to get honest with the Lord about where your desire is at. Maybe it's time that you say, Lord, there's stuff in my life. There's patterns of behavior. Lord, it needs adjusting. You died for it. You didn't just come to patch up my old life. You gave me a new life. And somehow I'm not seeing that reality in my life right now. So what does fasting do? Fasting deals with your flesh. It's ruthless with your flesh. It takes no mercenaries. It shows no mercy. It takes no prisoners. Fasting deals with your flesh and it puts it into the ground and stomps it and it's like, quiet, you don't have say anymore. Hey? Praying in tongues. 
lifts up your spirit. That you can hear God, you can, you can encounter God, you can walk with God. What's happening? Fasting pushes the old flesh and the old man down. Praying in tongues lifts up the new man. How easy it is to hear his voice. How easy it is to enjoy him. How easy it is to be moved by him. What's the quantity like of the Holy Spirit in your life? How much of the Holy Spirit is in your life? Is there every now and then there's these certain moments? I want to say to you, my friends, that there's depth. There's depth that the Spirit of God wants to bring to your life. There's depth. You know why? Because the Spirit is so dynamic. The Holy Spirit is so dynamic. He's so diverse. Many of us are just stuck on this one thing. I think that's the only thing the Spirit can do or will do with my life. While there's so much more that He can do with you. Amen? There's dimensions in God. There's dimensions in God. I want to say this. God is a multidimensional God. He's bigger than the circumstance you're finding yourself in. He's bigger than the challenges that you might find. He's a God. The Bible speaks of a multifaceted diamond. There's different dimensions to God that you can enjoy. Fasting helps you to, to learn the different dimensions of God. Have I excited anyone to go fast? <laughs> I find it fascinating. I don't know whether you watch YouTube every now and then. I find it fascinating how intermittent fasting all of a sudden, this is the newest trend. You can even join an app and they will tell you when to eat and when to fast. Anyone? Do you know that app? You don't have to get it. Because fasting is not about that. Fasting is about, Lord, I want to be alone with you. I want to eat your word. I want to just enjoy you. Imagine what it will look like, what your life will look like. I know when my fasting journey started, I reasoned with the Lord. It's like, I can't go without food. What will happen to me? I can't go without food for so long. What will happen to me? It's amazing to see that God, after all, is right again. Fasting rejuvenates your physical body. Fasting resets your soul. Fasting gets you sensitive to the voice of God that you can enjoy the full benefit of everything Jesus paid for. I want to pray this morning for those of us who've lost your expectation. You've lost your expectation that God will do great things with your life. Somehow your mindset, somehow your attitude has become small. You feel washed out. I've done this thing for so long, I'm tired, I can't. If that's you this morning, I'd love for you to stand. Wonderful. If there's more, you're welcome to stand. The next, the next altar call is going to be more challenging, so... If, just, just warning you. <laughs> Wonderful. And then I want to pray this morning for those of us that you are so set in your ways. You've become so rigid. God better not move to the left or to the right. Otherwise, he's lost you. I want to pray for those this morning that's stubborn. You know that there's things the Lord has for your life, but you're stubborn. You're holding your ways, you're holding your patterns, you're holding your things. And this morning, the Lord is saying, man, I've got so much more. There's diversity, there is depth, there is dimension to me. If you would simply humble yourself, and bow your knee so that I can deal with your stubbornness. That's a wonderful altar call, isn't it? The Lord says this, whoever humbles himself, he will exalt. If you live with pride, he will humble you. But if you humble yourself, he will exalt you. Fasting is one of the most profound ways of just humbling yourself, saying, Lord, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, reality, 
So I want to pray for you that's responded this morning. I want us to lay hands on you for an activation of His presence. But the reality is that the work is, happy, is going to happen in your kitchen. Fasting doesn't happen in the church. It happens in your study and in your kitchen. Is that all right? When you say no to food and you just put those things aside to be with Jesus. I want to ask you, if that's you, would you mind to come? If you're standing right now, would you mind to come to the front? I'd love just to lay hands on you. I'd love the elders to pray with you. If there's more of you, just come. Please come. Well done. You guys are amazing in responding that way. Ma'am, would you mind just to squeeze in? We can create some space. Can I say, friends, it's amazing what happens in the times of fasting. The reality of God becomes more real than the people in this world. He becomes more real than anyone in this world. So if you're here and you still need to respond, just come real quick. Just come real quick. Now, please, if you've responded this morning, I think part of what the Lord is doing is to say, hey, you have to embrace a fasting routine. Let the Lord show you. For some of you, you just need to stop breakfast. For some of you, you might just have to stop lunch or stop. Let the Lord guide you. For some of you, He's going to say, do three days. For some of you, He's going to say, 21 is your marker. For some of you, He might press you a little bit longer. But let him determine that. Is that okay? So here's how we're going to pray. I know that you're comfortable, so would you mind to stand with me? I know those chairs become horribly comfortable. If you still need to come, please come join me. Here's how we're going to pray this morning. If you're standing here, it's because the Spirit of the Lord is moving you because there's more. And so I want you to repent. If you've got a small mind, your expectation in God has become so low. I want you to repent. To say, Lord, this morning I choose to think different about my life. I repent. I'm going to think different from this moment on. I'm going to start to trust you for so much more. And this morning, if you're stubborn, if you're one of those stubborn ones, you want your way, then you're going to pray like that as well. Say, Lord, I repent of my stubbornness this morning. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. I'm going to listen to you. And so I want to ask you, just as you have responded, just where you're standing, do you mind to close your eyes and, and have a simple prayer of repentance just towards the Lord? I'm going to ask the team to lead us, and I'm going to ask the elders and deacons to come and lay hands on you. We're going to trust just for an activation, just the presence of the Lord that will activate you this morning in this journey. You're here this morning and you've never, never yielded, bow your knee before Jesus. You cannot say with certainty, man, I'm going to make it into heaven because I believe in Jesus this morning. I'd love to lead you in a simple prayer. You can confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Is there anyone like that? Just with a quick showing of the hand. Anyone that wants to yield your lives to Jesus. Wonderful. So I know you're hungry for more. <laughs> You're hungry for more, but you can come. Please come. Come, Nils. Come in. I'd love to pray with you. You're desperate for God. Come. I'd love to pray with you. I'm ask the team to lead us. Just where you're at. You enjoy God. I hand the meeting back to Rudo, and we're going to pray for these friends of ours this morning.